This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake to the sound of a train. The clack, clack, clack of wheels. In the distance, is that the sound of birds in a forest? No. It's angels in a choir. Or is it demons from hell? It doesn't matter. You have no memory of how you got here. All you know is that you're lost. And that now, you belong to the Grey Rooms. Welcome, roomies, to episode 13. We hope you are enjoying the season so far, and I would like to thank each and every one of you for your support. Lachlan Watt takes us on a journey towards an awful fate. Might want to get your mops out for this one. It's going to get bloody. We'd like to remind everyone that submissions for all Grey Rooms production podcasts are open. This includes season 5 of the Grey Rooms, Bane, Ghost Signal, your own featured Grey Rooms miniseries, and a new upcoming Grey Rooms production we like to call Fireside Nightmares. So, if you have any terrifying tales you think might frighten us, send them on over so we can take a stab at it. There will be a link in the show notes with more information on the process, what we're looking for, and how to submit. But without further ado, please enjoy episode 13. Aren't like you know, whamming the rain away. <sighs> For the last time, that's not how this works. I can't just make it do whatever I want. Well, it's magic, isn't it? Can't you just magic one thing into another? No. Todd, given that she survived such unusual circumstances and escorted us across this strange realm for the last few weeks, perhaps we should take Miss Winters at her word. <sighs> all right, all right. It'd just be nice not to be dripping all over your nice captain's cabin or whatever this is. I think I've got some spare towels. Hang on. This is where you've been living. Yep. She's called the last. I doubt she'll ever sail again, but a lot of the others live here by the water. By the docks. And she makes for a heck of a scenic apartment. <laughs> when it's not raining... Yeah. Where did all this come from? The ship or my things? Both. 
You said we are still in the Hells, but I've been to every layer, and I've never seen a place in Lucifer's domain that looked like this. Yeah. Well, there was that forest a few days ago. All those ruins are on the roadside. <laughs> what, what gives, Miss Winners? Uh, you... you guys want tea? Oh, yes, please. Good. I want tea. Samantha. This is... It's complicated. We're in the hells, yes. But not, uh, your hells. Come again. Look, I've had it explained to me a few times by the other members of the group. Lucifer screwed up, I guess. The first time he tried to make the hells. So, instead of scrapping it or remaking it entirely, he just abandoned this place, and then made the multi-layer shit show we all know and love. Poppycock. Uh, isn't it? Oh, Poppycock. I ain't never heard of an old version of hell. I've heard rumors a long time ago, but I thought they were just that. If we are where you say we are, Samantha, this is a dear secret indeed. And we are considerably safer than we might be otherwise. I'm not even sure the Warden knows of this place. So, uh, Sam, uh, you, you kept me in the dark this whole time. Eh? Who are all those people? There's a whole little town here. And the people on the road look like all kinds. I couldn't figure out if they were mortals or, or elves or angels or what. They were... all kinds. This place is a kind of refuge from the factions. From the exploitation of mortals by the Grove, the Mount, and the Hells. Bob, I'm part of a resistance. They don't call it that, not really. They call themselves Defiant. A resistance? Some kind of terrorist cell. What's their goal? They didn't... Uh, well, they didn't really have a goal at all before I showed up. Apparently folks just found their way in. Dribs and drabs over the centuries. Word spread and people from the different factions that didn't want to play their part or whatever ended up here. And... Uh, this is this why you reached out to me? Why, why we got Bob out of the rooms? Yes. <sighs> Bob, you said you wanted to understand why you were changing, right? Whatever I did to you, you want to figure it out? Very badly. As I said... Demons are not supposed to be able to... I can. That's my power, see? It has something to do with the very nature of reality. That's why my... Whammy, or whatever. Why I can't just flip the weather on a whim, Todd. I don't want to mess around with what rain is. (sighs) Both of you know what I used to be. Before I died, I was a... I was a monster. I used this gift to twist people up. I did things to my world. I... I invited powerful creatures, beasts, and monsters to join me in ruling the lesser people. After I died, well... I've met some people that I think came from my world here. Their lives were brutal, even after the Bitch Queen was dead. That's why I'm here, guys. That's why I reached out to you, Todd. That's why we needed you, Bob. The Resistance didn't have a purpose before I came along. And now, it does. 
change. Yes. What? Sorry, you lost me. You said, in the rooms, you said that you weren't that man anymore. Remember? The Todd that blew up the domes. Damn right I'm not. And you wanted to prove that. That's why you helped me. Well, then you're my friend, you daft old goat. <laughs> but yeah, I, I did it to prove I ain't him. This refuge, it's... You said it was Lucifer's first iteration. <laughs> I knew you'd get it. Look, I, I'm touched and excited and happy all at the same time, but, but I'm still in the dark here. You want to let poor old groundskeeper in on his big secret? She means to undo it all, man. To upturn the realms and unseat the factions. Holy hell. Oh, how? Why? You know why. You've seen what the factions mean. Scraping and backstabbing. Fighting over every scrap. Mortals, nothing more than coins that can scream. Some of the others told me about why the factions came into play. The old war, the... Far, I guess you call them? But that was a long time ago. Things are different now. We don't need a bunch of queens and dukes and angelic hosts running things. Well, and it's more than that, yeah? Bob would... Oh, I don't know, it, hitting the big button or whatever, would it, would it unchain all the demons? Free to grow from the courts, let the house do whatever they want? I don't... I don't know. But I assume that's the supposition your friends are running with. <laughs> Cookie for the smart demon. Okay, right. So that's... Why? I, I, I kind of get it if I squint a bit, but, but how? What's the button? Why did you need Bob? We may look like we're seated on a sailing ship, floating in choppy seas. But in truth, we are swimming in pure soul stuff. If Lucifer created this place during the Faction War and then abandoned it, the essence of this place is... Well, it's pure. It's untainted by the dukes, or the hosts, or the courts. I'm new to this stuff too, Todd. But the way I understand it, the factions have made and remade their sanctums over and over and over again. So the stuff that makes up, say, the Sixth layer, it's been around the block. Or, more recently, it's been imported from the mortal realms as a product of the Grey Rooms. Those souls are valuable, mutable, but tarnished. So you're saying is, what you're you saying is, this place is a weapon. Yep. Uh, saying you need Bob to uh, fire it. Maybe. There are a bunch of mortals here, folks from the Grove and the Mount. Even a guy from the Far comes here every once in a while. But until recently, no demons. I guess your people, uh... They do not call us the Chained Ones without reason. Some others have arrived from the Hells. Yeah. They were the ones who told us about you and the Admiral and everything. They're why I knew to reach out to Todd. Steve and Molly? Ha! <laughs> well, Baba Biscuits. Interesting. I'd like to speak with them. But why did you bring up my people? And how can I... Fire the weapon, as Todd put it. <laughs> no idea. That's why we came to get you. I'm about as good at magic as I was at keeping plants alive back at my apartment. Whammy, notwithstanding. And Steve and Molly seem... um... Young. For demons, yeah. So, the hope is that a group of individuals from the mortal realms, the hells, the mount and the Grove might be able to figure out how to unseal the potential of this abandoned realm and undo millennia of stagnation. Yep. And I'm the old man in the room. Sorry I didn't come get you just for old time's sake, but yeah. <laughs> Ha 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 
<laughs> I haven't heard that sound in a while. So, does that creepy mannequin laugh mean you'll help us? <laughs> Miss Winters, I would be honored. How do we get started? Well, let's get some sleep. Then tomorrow we go meet the rest of the crew. Todd? Bob? Welcome to the Defiant. Hugo just about took the door off its hinges with a single kick. The three of us quickly stepped through and into the abandoned bar. For a moment, we all just stood there. The butchered carcass of the conversation we should have been having gathered a few more flies. It was like this every time we stopped running. The knowledge of the ruin we'd brought upon ourselves rushed in to fill the gaps left by the lack of forward momentum. What's this place called? The Bitter End. I'll call the frog. He shouldn't be too far away. I see a phone behind the bar. Hurry, we got a storm brewing. Hugo grunted his acknowledgement. Of all of us involved in this mess, he'd paid the steepest physical price. The lump of exotic material that had been surgically implanted behind his left eye was supposed to grant him special powers. But instead, it had stolen his sight in that eye first, then his sense of smell, before quickly claiming his sense of taste. After that, his deterioration got harder to map. There was a moodiness and irritability that hadn't been there before, along with a tendency to tactlessly give voice to every thought that popped into his head. Our enforcer had been reduced to a blunt instrument, and Riley being too blinded by his research to take notice. In the end, it had fallen to me to keep a roof over our heads. Most days, I took a stool and easel out to the town square and sketched quick portraits and caricatures in exchange for whatever people could spare. We'd chosen this sad little company town because it was one of the only places the Church of Verity didn't have a foothold. But the local security forces were hardly art lovers. I'd take a rifle butt to the skull the first time they'd caught me. Sometimes it still hurt. Freddy's on his way. If he has what we need, we have to be ready to take the next step. What? We can't. I'm with Riley. We can't rush this. We need to do this right. When we hit the church... I don't want it to be anything they're going to recover from. Fuck you, Emma. You're not the one with a fucking battery in your head. Riley, of course, made a show of noticing my discomfort before he caught his stare and looked away. Another piece of Riley's performative compassion. I felt cheated. I couldn't argue that Riley wasn't the one who'd kept our group together during some dark moments. When the church had gunned down Bobby, Riley was the one with the stoic talk of loyalty and commitment. When we were all almost caught in the recent raid on our hideout, he was the one that got us here, to the bitter end. When I had the breakdown that led me to holding a piece of broken glass to my own throat, he was the one that made me feel, for want of a better word, loved. It was all lies. But at least those lies kept me going. It was only very recently that I'd realized just how cold Riley actually was. He could make you feel like the only person in the world that mattered. But at his core, he was a reptile. Whenever he thought he was alone, 
when he didn't have to be on, he just shut down, dead-eyed and motionless. He's here. Rain drummed against the pavement outside. A tall figure stepped through the ruined door, muttering and swearing to himself. Freddy the Frog had arrived. It's fucking rain. Gotta be kidding me. Uh, You do pick the nicest places. Are we ready to do business? Everyone had a different explanation for the slightly greenish tinge to Freddy's skin. The consensus seemed to be that it was something genetic. Some hereditary quirk of dubious evolutionary benefit. He was a strange man, and possibly the only presence in town less welcome than the three of us. For his part, Freddy had an enviable ability to completely disregard what others thought of him. None of us had wanted to deal with him, but, as anybody would tell you, there were some things only Freddy could find. Have you got what we paid for? It wasn't easy. I had to... Don't mess us around, Freddy. Have you got it? Freddy produced a small, newspaper-wrapped package from his dripping wet coat and walked over to place it carefully on top of the bar. Have a look. The three of us gathered around. Riley shot me a look. My hands trembled as I reached for the package and unwrapped what looked like, but definitely wasn't, a stick of school teacher's chalk. I turned it over carefully in my hands as I examined it. Are you sure I can't offer you a deal on some other doomsday artifacts? I've got some lovely original sheet music for that song that will end the world lying around somewhere. Is it enough? I don't know. Hugo's eyes glazed over and inhaled deeply through flared nostrils. His arm raised, and he pointed a single accusing finger at Freddy. He's holding out on us. He's got more in his pocket. A revolver appeared in Riley's fist, as if by magic. And in an instant, he pressed the barrel hard against the side of Freddy's bald green head. Wait a minute. Shut up. We paid you to bring us everything you could find. You're holding out on us. I wouldn't do that. I could only stare and watch as the room changed in front of me within seconds. What remained of the splintered door came crashing inward off its hinges. A dark figure in black sweeping into the bar behind it. Hugo stepped in front of me and raised a handgun that I didn't even know he'd been carrying. In the same second, Riley grabbed Freddy by the throat and pulled him in close, pushing the revolver under his chin and cocked the hammer. You! Drop it! The door from the back of the bar fell down as if it had barely been on its hinges. Another figure dressed in the same black gear as the first came in through the kitchen. He carried a rifle, sweeping the room in front of him and training his aim on me. The fear sent a cold sensation nagging at the back of my neck, but I didn't otherwise react. For a moment, the room stood still and nothing happened. All right, let's stay calm. Stay calm. Here's what's going to happen. Hugo fired first. The gunshot wasn't as loud as I'd expected. The man that had been aiming at me dropped his rifle and clutched at the blood spraying from his neck. He was still on his feet when the other gunman returned fire. Hugo worked the trigger of his pistol. Sound and glass started exploding from the windows at the front of the bar. The original gunman, who had kicked in the door, was left diving for cover behind one of the tables that had been tipped over the center of the bar. There was an eerie silence that came with the ringing in my ears. It left me stunned for a moment as I watched Hugo duck around the bar for a better angle on our unexpected guest. Straining my ears and snapping back into reality, I could hear our new friend fumbling with his gun, probably trying to clear a jam, when Hugo slid into the scene and presented the gunman with a bullet to the face. All right. Please, please listen. I had to bring them with me. 
They took my nephew, sent me his finger. They, they said if I didn't... Uh, uh. Grabbing his collar and shoving him away, Riley caught Freddy completely off balance. Riley aimed his revolver in Freddy's direction and squeezed the trigger. <gasps> Freddy's arms flew to protect his face as the bullet entered his gut. But this wasn't enough. <gasps> Riley held the trigger down and fanned the hammer. Freddy's body danced and convulsed as round after round hit and bit chunks out of his flesh. When the revolver clicked empty, he tripped and collapsed in the doorway. My head was swimming in the scent of blood and gunpowder. This isn't how it's supposed to go. Who are they? Freddy sold us out. Hugo walked over and with his foot, rolled one of the gunmen onto his back. Ah, shit. It's an Inquisitor. It's the Church of Verity's goon squad. Hugo clutched at his side and started to sway, bumping into the chairs around him. It wasn't long before he was the one on the floor. I rushed over and helped him peel off his jacket. And that's when I found a gunshot wound just above his hip. When I applied pressure, the blood that poured out of the wound between my fingers was black. How bad is it? You're... you're going to be fine. I continued to apply pressure and look to Riley for anything that would help. Any words to give us comfort. Instead, Riley had put his revolver back on his hip and was pulling items from his jacket. He swept a few empty bottles from the bar top with a crash and started arranging things on top of it. It only took me a second before I recognized the pieces we'd stolen earlier from the church. With Freddy's contribution, we had all we needed for the ritual. What are you doing? We need to do this now. Hugo's bleeding out. This might be our only chance. Hugo needs to get stitched up now. The bullet hit his liver. If we don't go now, he's going to die. If the church is onto us, then none of us are getting out of this building alive. Riley's right. Company security never comes out after dark. And we... We don't have any backup. There's nothing to stop the church from turning this whole fucking place into a free fire zone. <coughs> he coughed up a thick, black clot. <coughs> they won't take me alive. A spotlight hit the shattered glass at the front of the bar bathing the three of us in cold, jagged light. Emma? Emma, please! We just want to talk! What you're doing is wrong! Hugo clamped his hands over my own, not only to staunch the flow of blood that leaked from his wound, but to keep me in check. Looking me in the eyes, he nodded to the front of the bar. Go. Talk with her. It might buy Riley some time. I slid my hand out from under Hugo's mitt and along the floor over to Freddy's body where it slumped just inside the doorway. My hands, sticky with blood, shook as I moved from pocket to pocket of his old jacket, searching until I found and removed another stick of the chalky, greasy substance that had just cost four people their lives. I stood slowly and held it out to Riley. What do you expect me to do with that? I need to go out there. Just for a minute. Forget it. You're the artist. I can't draw the runes. You can draw a circle, can't you? If we're doing this, you need to get it started. Guys, we really need to... My eyes squinted in the spotlight's glare, and as I raised the palms of my hands, I stepped out onto the street. The spotlight dipped to pick out the figure of a young, dark-haired woman standing in the street a few dozen yards away. She was wearing a long white dress with an oversized black jacket wrapped around her slim shoulders. It was just like the ones the dead gunman had worn. Faith, what are you doing here? Emma! Please! You have to stop! You have to stop. You know we can't. They've told me what you're trying to do, 
This is blasphemy. Blasphemy. Faye, that's not you talking. Please, Em, you can stop this. Come home. Nobody hates you. Faye held out her hand to me and tried to take a step closer, her leg catching as something tugged at her ankle and held her back. This wasn't right. As my eyes drifted from her hem, I was suddenly very aware of all the guns bristling in the shadows, watching. My eyes drifted back to Faye and caught the flutter of her dress as it shifted and revealed a long red wire trailing back into the darkness. None of this is right. That cold feeling flaring at the back of my neck again intensified. Faye, no! How could you? How could... An arm snaked around my waist and started to drag me back towards the bar. Come on, it's another trick. As I took one last look at Faye, I watched her eyes go black and was struck by the shift. Struck by how clear and unfeeling they were. There was purpose communicated by her mere presence. Emma, don't look! Faye slowly walked towards me, her hands raising above her head. There was a look of rapture on her face. Like at any moment, someone would grab her hand and pluck her from the ground. A moment later, the suicide vest she wore was triggered. In an instant, the world went black and fell apart. When it came back together, I was lying just outside the bitter end. I'd grown used to the non-stop sounds of a company town, but now they'd all faded away, like my head had been dunked in a bucket of seawater. In the moment, the silence and muffled sounds didn't matter. My brain was so disoriented from the blast that it was having trouble even remembering my own name. I sat stunned and just watched the scene unfold around me. Without sound, it was hard to register the flashes of light that erupted from the end of a muzzle. I could only gawk as they flickered in my vision. Hugo's clothes were in tatters, as was he. He must have taken the brunt of the explosion. His jacket was peeling off of him, exposing the blackened skin that was falling away to reveal bone in some spots. He held Riley's revolver in one hand and his own handgun in the other. Both weapons flashed as he fired into the darkness. He didn't flinch as another bullet hit him in the arm, spraying flesh and blood across the street behind him. His eyes were glowing. He was already dead, animated beyond the moment of expiration by the exhaustive effect of the alien battery we paid a black market doctor to wire into his head. As my mind snapped back into the reality of the situation, I tried to pull myself onto my feet, only to collapse. My mind screaming that I needed to find cover, I willed my legs again, tried and succeeded. As I stood, something clipped my shoulder hard enough to push me forward and pitch me into the doorframe. I grit my teeth, knowing I'd been shot. There were enough bullets flying around tonight that it was only a wonder I hadn't been shot sooner. Riley had been busy in the chaos. He pushed all the furniture against the walls and had drawn a large, loose circle with the chalk. He was wild-eyed, whipping his head from side to side, like he was completely without peripheral vision. I had never seen him like this before. He offered the stick of chalk and pointed at the outer rim of the circle. He seemed to be yelling something over the gunfire that continued to pelt the side of the building. I took the chalk from his hands and shook my head, unsure. With urgency, he pointed again. The symbols! The symbols. I knew the symbols by heart, having practiced them until I could draw them in my sleep. I'd never allowed myself to think of them as something arcane or beyond understanding. They were just a simple combination of meaningless scribbles that, once completed, would unlock the path to something I wanted. 
what was left of Hugo appeared in the doorway. Somewhere along the way, he'd lost an arm in the battle, and blood fountain from multiple wounds in his chest. His legs weren't any better. Chewed up, but the battery worked its charm. He didn't even limp. There was a grin on his face, a crescent of yellow teeth that beamed through his blood-drenched beard. This was no longer a man, and I couldn't help but scream. Hugo had just opened his mouth to say something when a bullet carved a tunnel from the back of his skull to his temple. There was a moment of pause after the shot, and surprisingly, his footing kept beneath him. With his one remaining arm, his fingers drifted to the hole and started grasping at the edges. A white light spilled through the gaps in his fingers from the mechanical intrusion we'd implanted. I felt Riley grab me by the shoulder, again attempting to direct me to the edges of the circle. I couldn't turn away from the horror of his fingers probing the wound. And with a click, his head exploded in a flash of light so bright that it left a bruise-colored smear across my field of vision. Whatever was left of the brain matter that the implant had grown into flowered from his ruined skull like a nightmare urchin hatched at the bottom of the ocean's darkest chasm. Hundreds of hair-thinned filaments radiated out from the stump of his neck, whirring and whipping droplets of blood from their tips as they were stirred into a frenzy. With a thud, he slumped to his knees. The filaments went still, turned gray, and started to flake away. My eyes were stuck, staring into the nightmare of gored flesh that was my friend, and I was numb. Once again, I felt Riley's hand covering mine. It occurred to me that I should try and shake him away. And then, I let him guide me away from the maw of flesh and gore. We had to leave. We had to leave now. Shoving the crumbled chalk into my hand, I pressed it to the cracks and we drew the symbols, working together in the dark. There was silence around us. No one was firing upon us from outside. Either Hugo's efforts had forced the Church of Verity to regroup, or he'd killed them all. Emma, it's time. We stood and faced each other in the circle drawn on the floor of the now-wrecked bar. I could feel a vibration in my knees. There was an energy in the air around us for a moment, and when it stopped, I wondered if I had only imagined it. Nothing was happening. There was no movement in the room other than Riley slipping his hand behind his back. I know this is too soon, but all we need now is... I ducked down and yanked the short-bladed knife from the sheath of my boot, and was back on my feet before Riley realized what was happening. I closed the distance between us in the blink of an eye and didn't flinch as I swiped the razor-sharp blade across Riley's throat. He choked on the air and the blood pouring from the wound and sat down hard, one hand on the wound on his throat, the other still desperately groping for something behind him. His hand did nothing to staunch the blood, and it pumped out like a geyser, timed to his heartbeat. The first few spurts were under so much pressure that they shot all the way across the room. And now, as his heart slowed, the stream lacked spirit. His eyes slowly misted over. Rich, dark blood that painted the room dripped from the ceiling and splashed walls, now pooled within the drawn chalk circle. Are you there? I was alone, but the room didn't feel empty. It was off. I noticed the smell first. Burnt plastic. It made my eyes water, and I was hit by an almost incapacitating wave of nausea. It passed within minutes, but once it had, I realized I wasn't alone. Someone or something was behind me. The whole room seemed to tilt. Turn. And look at me. It wasn't possible, but I recognized that voice. Gentle yet commanding. 
authoritative but also intimate. For no reason I could discern, it terrified me. There are materials in this world that although imperfect can serve as a beacon, those were the words on the very first page. Look at me. No. We can wait forever. I took a deep breath and turned around. It was a poor choice. The thing had too many eyes. All of them staring into the river of raw emotions currently carving a channel through my psyche. I'd never felt so exposed. The shock and grief over losing my sister. The guilt of what had happened to Hugo. The pure hatred and anger directed at Riley over what he had dragged me into. I could sense all these feelings being perused like you might read a newspaper. My being was being tipped to and fro to see if anything interesting would fall out. Well, we have nothing in common. What are you? That voice doesn't belong to you. I'm whatever you were looking for. An ally against a false god. A means to an end. A way out. My breathing was shallow. If I lost control now, that would be the end. To let this thing see any more weakness and vulnerability would be like giving a shark the scent of blood. You are a being of power. I brought you here. You brought me here. <laughs> you opened the door. You stepped through. This is our world. I glanced around. I could still see the walls and ceiling of the bitter end painted with blood and riddled with gunfire. But the windows were black, and I couldn't see what was outside. This is our world. What are you doing here? We took something. A book. How did you get it? We heard the Church of Verity was moving stuff across town in an armored car, stuff from their collection. We thought we could fence some of it. Riley said he knew people. We robbed them. It went bad. People died. You were sloppy. I nodded. There was something wet on my cheeks. I didn't know why I was so upset. It had all been Bobby's fault after all. He'd complained all morning about the mask he was wearing, saying he couldn't breathe or see properly. We hadn't expected him to remove it right in the middle of the heist. Right in front of witnesses. I don't know who survived to snitch us out. It wasn't the guards. Hugo and I blasted them full of holes once we saw that they'd gotten a look at Bobby's face. I'd closed my eyes as I pulled the trigger. It wasn't the driver either. I'd made Bobby do that job himself. It certainly wasn't the mother and her young daughter that had just stood on the corner, shocked into stillness until Riley gunned them both down. Whoever had seen Bobby's face, they'd gotten word to the Church of Verity quick enough that not a week had gone by before the wanted posters started appearing everywhere. It wasn't just Bobby, but all four of us. Whoever the church had tracking us must have done enough asking around to figure out who it was that Bobby ran with. We were all rattled enough to start making mistakes, but it was Riley who suggested reading the book we were supposed to be trying to sell. That's when we found out that it wasn't a church text, but one they wanted to repress. We had been desperate. There was no other explanation for what followed. We scored more guns, serious firepower. Riley talked Hugo into receiving the implant. Our next heist was even more brutal than the first. We hit one of the church's outreach centers in the middle of the day, ostensibly after cash, really after a chance to draw the Inquisitors into a gunfight. It had cost us Bobby. We'd left him on the curb outside the center, kicking and twitching in a pool of blood. A bullet lodged in his spine. We'd accounted for six of the church's inquisitors by the time we'd made our getaway. That night's news bulletin only credited us with two. What do you want? Again, I felt that probing of my emotions. It was like a handful of sand had been poured into my exposed brain to find and fill every crack. After a moment, I heard the thing laugh. 
<laughs> what do you want? You saw it. I know you did. What's wrong? Do I scare you? <laughs> you have wandered into a conflict that will still be raging when the last of your kind faces extinction. This sacrifice will be forgotten long before then. Are you sure? I don't need to answer, but I take no small measure of pride in the knowledge that I've given this thing pause. Then so be it. There's no drive as strong as the one that propels us towards self-destruction. If you let it, the little whispering voice that tells you to steer your car into oncoming traffic, or to swim out further than you think you can return from, will become a chorus. My body erupts in flames, enveloping me in their warmth as I plummet. In the moments before impact, I tell myself that this is what I was born for. To be the wave that breaks upon the shore. To be the whole sea falling upon my foe. To rise again and again and to throw myself at the wall for no better reason than it exists. I'm white hot, traveling at several times the speed of sound as I pierce the clouds above the Church of Verity's great dome citadel. When I hit, it's for everyone I loved. The sister they brainwashed, the parents they enslaved, the friends who had their shows of defiance thrown back at them with more force than could ever be justified. A sphere of pure white blossoms in the sky just above the citadel. Weeks from now, the city's skeletal husk will still be smoldering. They'll never know my name. The woman who did this to them. But their god, who swims through a heaven more crowded than any of us could imagine, will remember the day a mortal made him bleed. Bitter End, written by Lachlan Watt, featuring performances by Rissa Montanez as Emma, David O'Steele as Hugo, Graham Rowett as Riley, Michael Rigg as Freddy, Nea Duraso as Faye, and Peter Lewis as The Thing. We Are Defiant, written by Michael Zenke, featuring performances by Graham Rowett as Bob, Alastair Mackey as Todd, and Sarah Ruth Thomas as Samantha Winters. Musical compositions by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. And audio engineering and sound design is by me, Jason Wilson. And now that I've caught my breath for a second, <laughs> holy hell, remind me to never let Lachlan be in charge of planning for the future. It's all fun and games until your god is attacked and your city reduced to a burning husk. <sighs> well, we would also like to take this time to thank our patrons and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating or review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for more twisted souls to find the show. Patrons like Bridget Criswell, Ellen Houghton, Eric Pritchard, Eric Phones, Jackal Bot's Nose, Lynn Browning, Matthew Smith Deal, Patrick Stewart, Ronan Kumori, Sean Geary, Bepsi Man, Artemis the Gunter, and Melanie. You can find the Grey Rooms on Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite podcatcher. And we're also now available on iHeartRadio's Spreaker app. So download the iHeartRadio Spreaker app today, 
or open the browser and just search The Grey Rooms. And we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans, and we want to give back to you in the best way that we know how. So we have a lot of fun things to show you, and we hope, we hope that you like them. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your needs. And don't forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to support, showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And have you checked out our Discord server? If you only listen to the podcast, you're only getting half the experience. Join for free to hang out with Grey Rooms cast and crew, watch movies, listen to music, or learn to write your very own horror story. Our community grows daily, and you can meet and interact with like-minded fans from all over the world. And we just hung a new portrait in our board of directors' bathroom, so there's that. Episode 13. Lucky number 13, baby. (laughs) Only just over a handful left in this season. Don't forget, submissions are open. So go to thegrayrooms.com and click the submissions link and find out how you can become part of the canon of the Grey Rooms. Well, we have a lot more to do to get this handful out to you, because I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the intensity is turning up. That means so is the workload. And with that being said, time to get back to mallets with melons, ripping apart green peppers, and making things just sound very uncomfortable. Oh, cue all the dentist stories we can. Thanks again. Until next time, we'll see you next week. This has been a Grey Rooms audio production. Copyright 2022 and 2023. All rights reserved.